Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. Our book is The World of Philosophy, an introductory reader by Stephen Kahn. And we're going over in this video, The Body Problem by Barbara Montero, professor of philosophy at the College of Staten Island and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So her point in this article is that a lot of people say Consciousness comes from matter, it can be reduced to matter, it can be reduced to the processes of the physical body. <clears throat> and her question is, um, what is matter? How do you define matter? I like this article when I read it. Uh, I, was, I was looking forward to making this video on this article because I remember once in a political science class I took, the presumption was that human beings and all life forms and consciousness itself is an accidental byproduct of material particles combining through the process of evolution. And I believe with Plato uh, that consciousness is fundamental to the cosmos. It's not a byproduct of material evolution it's the ground of being itself so that's um so when the assumption was without question oh but consciousness is a byproduct of matter i said okay what is matter can anyone in this room define an atom that was the question i asked and then there was total silence for a few seconds and then an eruption of of anger <laughs> that I should question the dogma. Um, so when I read Barbara Montero questioning the dogma of physicalism, I said, oh good, I'll look forward to uh, making a video on this one. So I'm just going to read bits and pieces. It's only, uh, what is it, one, two, three, uh, about three pages. So is the mind physical? This is on page 130. And uh, oh yeah, for our exam, this is exam three. Question uh, four, no, question five from part B. What are Montero's criticisms of physicalism? Okay, so, and th this will also cover a potential answer for part A. Question one, which of the views on the relation of mind and body do you think presents the best argument? Okay, so she starts on page 130. Is the mind physical? Are mental properties such as the property of being in pain or thinking about the higher orders of infinity actually physical properties? Many philosophers think that they are, for no matter how strange and remarkable consciousness and cognition may be, many hold that they are nevertheless entirely physical. While some take this view as a starting point in their discussions about the mind, others, well aware that there are dissenters among the ranks, argue for it strenuously. One wonders, however, just what is being assumed, argued for, or denied. In other words, one wonders just what does it mean to be physical. This is the question I call the body problem. So this is the mind-body problem. That was question one for part B of this third exam. What is the mind-body problem? The mind-body problem is what is a mind, what is a body, how do they relate? Can the mind be reduced to the body? Can the body be reduced to the mind, like Berkeley would say? Um, is it some combination of the two, like Rene Descartes with his dualism? The mind is one, un, is a thinking substance not extended in space, and the body is an unthinking substance extended in space. That's the mind-body problem. So Barbara Montero is saying, all right, well, what about the body problem? What is the body? How do you define it? And as I've been mentioning throughout these videos uh, for this class and for every class I teach, the, the history of 20th century physics completely undermined the standard idea of what matter is, which is matter is just these fundamental particles of inert unthinking substance extended in space that endure through time and exist in three dimensions of absolute space. Up, down, left, right, backward, forward. This is Newtonian physics. And the Darwinian theory of evolution makes sense within that Newtonian framework. 
little bits, little ball bearings randomly combine over eons of time and given enough time and given enough of these collisions of these unthinking particles, self-replicating life emerges. DNA on our planet could be another form on another planet. Okay, but the problem is those little ball bearings of unthinking matter have been shown not to exist by relativity theory and quantum theory and string theory, which, which unites the two. String theory unites quantum mechanics and general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity as the curvature of space-time. So the assumption is still, this physicalism is still based on this Newtonian concept of space and time and matter. Take that away and the entire theory of physicalism is, is rendered baseless. And yet that doesn't seem to matter <laughs> to the powers that be because when you question it, you'll, well, one person, Richard Dawkins, a famous advocate of Darwinism and enemy of panpsychism, the idea of the theory that consciousness is fundamental to the cosmos, he calls quantum physics queerer than we can suppose, as I've mentioned before. It's too strange for us to even contemplate, so let's just ignore it and continue to hold on to the idea of these little unthinking, objectively real bar ball bearings of matter. Well, that's, that is not um, philosophically respectable. That's not, let's base our theory on a theory we know has been undermined. We know it isn't true. Maybe we don't know which one of the alternatives is more true and there's a lot to be discovered yet, but we know that Newton's theory of an atom has been disproven. And yet the theory of consciousness coming from matter is still based on that disproven theory. So let me just read, continuing here with uh, The Body Problem by Barbara Montero, page 131. As I see it, there is little use in arguing about whether the mind is physical or whether mental properties are physical properties unless we have at least some understanding of what it means to be physical. In other words, in order to solve the mind-body problem, we must solve the body problem. It strikes me as odd that while bookstores and journals are overflowing with debates about whether consciousness is physical, hardly anyone is concerned with the question, what counts as physical? Moreover, it would not be much of an exaggeration to say today, as John Earman did more than 20 years ago, so she published this in 2012, that attempts to answer this question that have appeared in the philosophical literature are, for the most part, notable only for their glaring inadequacies. I, I would second that emotion. Um, so I'm just going to continue here. I'm going to skip a little bit about what she says about tablehood, which brings up Plato's theory of the absolute ideas. I might get back to that later, but continuing on the left-hand column, page 131. While we can identify central cases of being physical, what could be clearer examples of physical than rocks and trees, except perhaps quarks and leptons? An extra wrinkle is that rocks and trees, as well as quarks and leptons, are clear cases only assuming that idealism is false. All right, so she brought up a few issues here. Rocks and trees are macroscopic objects that we can perceive with our eyes. Quarks and leptons are quantum particles, which are more fundamental than the rocks and the trees. The rocks and the trees actually aren't physical objects as we perceive them to be. They are constructed of these tiny little particles. And those particles themselves could be constructed of something even more fundamental, such as strings, which uh, Montero mentions over on the right-hand column on page 131. Um, so, and then she says, first, this is, this is all assuming that idealism is false, that, <clears throat> that matter exist. Idealism is a reference to Berkeley, the British empiricist after Locke and before Hume, who said all you ever experience, he was an empiricist, so he believed what he perceived through his empirical sense perceptions, sights, sounds, smells, touches, tastes. Um, I, I probably usually leave one of the five out, but he said that's all that we're actually experiencing, a sight. A sight is its own idea in the mind. It doesn't correlate to some unthinking physical substance outside of our mind. There's just minds and the ideas that they perceive. Okay, well then how come there's a difference between the private ideas that each of us can have 
And when we look out, or we appear to be looking out, and we see what we think is a physical object, everyone can see it. And he goes, that's because that so-called physical object is an idea in God's mind, and God's mind is infinitely powerful. So the substantiality of that idea is more enduring, and it's public, but it's still just an idea in the mind. And that there's Even if there were physical un thinking things outside of the mind to which our ideas of them correspond, it would be impossible to prove it. Because you can only prove something by examining it, and if you examine it, you've placed it in your mind. All right, so the first unwarranted assumption that physicalists make is that they dismiss idealism as false. Without mentioning it, it's just that's not a problem that they want to address. It's queerer than we can suppose you could probably assume would be the answer. So in any case, continuing here with Barbara Montero, something needs to be said about how to determine what, can pl uh, what we can place in the category along with rocks and trees. In certain ways, beliefs and desires are like rocks and trees, while quarks and leptons are not. For example, talk of beliefs and desires plays a role in our ordinary folk understanding of the world, while talk of quarks and leptons does not. Our, our everyday world is a world of three-dimensional space and linear time. That's what we actually experience, unless you're a unique kind of a person who can experience higher levels of extra-dimensional understanding. But the normal human being is born and raised with the assumption that we're in three dimensions of space, enduring through a linear timeline that flows forward everywhere at a constant rate. That's what we experience, and that's what's described by Newton's physics, which is why it's so compelling. It's also very useful within that narrow zone of, that we actually experience as humans. When things get very small, Newton's physics don't work anymore. When they get very big and heavy and move very quickly, Newton's physics don't work anymore. But for our folk understanding of the world, it works fine. Um, so rocks and trees we experience. And we, believe, we experience beliefs and desires. So that's something we experience every day. I've got a belief. I believe that physicalism is incorrect. I have a desire to make this video and move on to the next one and, and just keep on top of the semester, not let it get out of control. I saw trees today, I saw rocks today, but I haven't seen a quark or a lepton, and the language used to describe them is so complex and based on abstract concepts, it's, it's not like a rock or a tree or a, a desire or a belief that I have. And yet, physicalism would say that the quarks and the leptons are more real than the things like rocks and trees, because rocks and trees are made of quarks and leptons. Um, and yet, when you say, well, what is a quark? What is a lepton? What are these subatomic particles? And you have to bring up the particle wave paradox, which was, dis which was discovered through the two-slit experiment, which I've mentioned previously. Um, and before that was even discovered in 1927, Einstein had already revolutionized physics in 1905 and 1915 with special relativity and general relativity, one implication of which is the past, the present, and the future coexist. There's no evolution of three-dimensional space because the past, the present, and the future all coexist like a block of ice or a loaf of bread, the block universe. Uh, all right, so then we're going to get into some string theory, but... Um, I'm going to continue to read here. Beliefs and desires also are part of the same macro-level causal network as rocks and trees, while quarks and leptons are not. But few physicalists think that from our central examples of physical objects, we should infer that quarks and leptons are non-physical. Perhaps these problems could be overlooked if we had clear intuitions regarding the non-physical. But do we? The stock example of a non-physical entity is some kind of a ghost. All right, so what is non-physical? What are you trying to differentiate physical things from the non-physical and she mentions Cartesian souls and so Rene Descartes was the first reading for this mind-body problem part of the book and he defined mind as thinking substance that is not extended in space and he defined matter as unthinking substance extended in space but as uh, I mentioned in the video on Churchland, the gravitational singularity, for example, the source of all space, time, and matter at the Big Bang is not extended in space. 
Is it physical? Not according to the definition of something being extended in space. It's furthermore outside of space and time because a point of infinite gravity is the same as a point traveling infinitely fast. If you travel at the speed of light, time stops. So infinite speed would stop time, reverse it, stop it, reverse it again. All points of space-time are contained within a singularity. So it's not in space or time. It's not extended in space. It, con it contains all space and time. So is it physical? I say not according to Rene Descartes' definition. And as a matter of fact, according to Descartes' definition, it would be consciousness itself. I've mentioned before, I wrote a, uh, my dissertation and then to change it into a book about Carl Jung worked with the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, Carl Jung the psychologist, and Wolfgang Pauli, one of the co-founders of quantum mechanics. They had a theory that the laws of psychology should mirror the laws of physics because mind and matter both emerge from something more fundamental, which they call the unus mundus, also the archetype of the self, and the God archetype, and the one. Uh, and I'll get into that when we, when we go further into this reading, but... Um, the point is, what is matter? What is mind? She's saying, how do we define these terms? If it's not extended in space, then she'll go into this. Uh, but why is a ghost non-physical? Is it that they pass through walls without disturbing them? Neutrinos, I am told, can pass right through the earth without disturbing it, yet neutrinos are classified as physical. Is it that they have no mass? Photons have no mass, yet are considered physical. Perhaps it is that they supposedly do not take up space. But if taking up no space shows that something is non-physical, point particles, if they exist, would have to be classified as non-physical. Yet physicalists, I take it, would not accept this view. So to say that the physical means no spooky stuff does not help matters. All right. Point particles, the singularity, the gravitational singularity inside black holes and at the Big Bang and at every point of the quantum vacuum they have just so today is october 7th 2020 sir roger penrose the, the physicist who first proved using general relativity that uh black holes must form if, if a star of sufficient mass burns through its nuclear fuel it must necessarily collapse into a black hole with a gravitational singularity in the center then Stephen Hawking, this was in 1965, he said, oh, that's interesting. If I reverse your time equation for the formation of a black hole, I've got a good model for the Big Bang, which instead of col the universe collapsing into a point, it is exploding from a point. So Stephen Hawking later renounced the idea of a gravitational singularity because, he noted, Pope Pius XII said, oh, it sounds a lot like God. Everything created all at once from a point of infinite power sounds a little bit too much like God. So a lot of atheistic physicists therefore rejected the idea. And it seems to me they rejected it not for scientific reasons, but for theological reasons. Um, but at any rate, let me continue here. Uh, and also it's interesting, photons have no mass, Barbara Montero mentions. So photons travel at the speed of light and they have no mass. Nothing else can travel at the speed of light, says Einstein, because they have mass. And as the mass, as a little particle with a little bit of mass accelerates, acceleration is equivalent to gravity. So it would be like that little particle becoming heavier and heavier. The kinetic energy is equal to mass. The faster it goes, the heavier it becomes, which requires more energy to accelerate it a little bit more. And the law of diminishing returns, as it approaches the speed of light, it's it would approach infinite weight, which would require an infinite amount of energy to accelerate it anymore. So nothing with any mass at all, says Einstein, can travel at the speed of light. Light can do it. Photons can do it because they have because they have no mass. Well, in a black hole, after some so-called material particle passes the event horizon, it would accelerate faster than light, which is why even a photon could not escape. Anyway, I went off on that tangent because Sir Roger Penrose was given the Nobel Prize, I think yesterday it was announced, with two other physicists, um, whose names I forget, but I see their faces, who discovered a supermassive black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, but Sir Roger Penrose was given the Nobel Prize because he was the first physicist to show black holes must form. And um, I'm just pointing this out because he's a Platonist also. 
And as I'm going to read a little bit from Wolfgang Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli worked with Carl Jung. Both of them were essentially Platonists. Consciousness is fundamental to the cosmos. It's not a byproduct of physical interactions. What is the physical? Well, the physical, if everything is, the physical is understood as the basic smallest building blocks, well then the physical is the singularity from which all of those building blocks radiate. And that can't be considered physical if it's outside of space and time, even though it contains all space and time. That's, which is why I say the gravitational singularity is just another word for the psyche or the soul or the mind. Which overcomes the problem of dualism by saying mind and matter both emerge from this more fundamental entity. But continuing here on the right-hand column, 131, Barbara Montero, perhaps physicalism at least excludes the possibility of a ghost in a machine. That is the view that there is some type of mental substance completely different in kind from physical substance. But what does this view amount to since most physicalists are happy to admit that there is more than one kind of elementary particle? Perhaps the idea is that whether only one basic particle exists, say strings, or it turns out that in addition to strings there are also ferris wheels, Physicalism holds that everything non-basic is composed of the same kind or kinds of basic particles. But this view cannot be right. For example, some evidence indicates that what physicists call dark matter is composed entirely of axions, hypothetical new elementary particles. All right, so she mentioned string. String theory is the attempt to unite quantum mechanics, which is the theory of the very tiny and general relativity, the theory of the very massive and fast-moving objects. You can't use general relativity to describe subatomic particles. You can't use quantum mechanics to describe massive objects such as planets orbiting the Sun. It's the theory of gravity. But we have one nature, so you would think there should be one law of physics that works all the way up and all the way down at every scale. And that's what string theory proposes to do. It provides a quantum particle to carry the force of gravity, a graviton, a theoretical graviton. Strings are supposedly material. They have extension in space, but their extension in space is so tiny that it can't be measured with technology available to us today. So a lot of physicists say that's not a real physical theory because it's not empirically observable. You couldn't demonstrate it in a laboratory. You couldn't point to it and it doesn't have any kind of a, a way to test it to falsify it well I guess it probably does at any rate I'm not going to get into the whole issue of falsifiability yet um, which Karl Popper philosopher of science brought up but um, the point here is all right so what what is matter maybe it's strings or some other kind of stuff at any rate it's the most basic stuff and then she's saying yeah well dark matter is supposed to be made of as of yet undetermined particles, so it's hard to know what you're saying. It's the most basic stuff. There could be more than one type of basic stuff. So continuing here, uh, philosophers, this is page 132, philosophers commonly answer this question by deferring to the physicists. The physical is said to be whatever the physicist, or more precisely, the particle physicist, tells us exists. What we might now think of as quarks and leptons, as well as the exchange particles, gluons, gravitons, etc., and the non-physical is whatever remains if there is anything. On this view, physicalists, that is, those who hold that everything is physical, claim that physics provides us with an exhaustive and exclusive line to reality. Okay. Um, so, the physical is whatever the physicists tell us. But that's got a problem because the physicists will tell us that the, the laws of physics aren't complete yet. And she brings up this issue. Um... So the bottom of the left-hand column. My concern, however, is not with the dependence relation per se, but with what everything is being related to. The lower level dependence base, or what is often referred to as the microphysical. One thinks of microphysical phenomena as described by the most recent microphysics. But if the physical is defined in terms of current microphysics and a new particle is discovered next week, the particle will not be physical, a consequence most philosophers want to avoid. But if not current microphysics, what else could the microphysical be? All right, so what is, the, what is physical? It's whatever the physicists say it is. All right, but they, next week they, just, they might discover a new particle. Since the physicists today don't call it a material particle because they don't know about it, 
this new particle that's discovered that has measurable qualities is nevertheless, by that definition, not physical because the physicists didn't know about it. So Carl Hempel posed a dilemma for those attempting to define the physical in reference to microphysics. On the one hand, we cannot define the physical in terms of current microphysics, since today's microphysics is probably neither entirely true nor complete. On the other hand, if we take microphysics to be some future unspecified theory, the claim that the mind is physical is vague since we currently have no idea of that theory. Oh, well, physical is whatever the physicists say is the fundamental building block or building blocks of nature in the future. We're close now, we're almost there, and when they finally figure it all out, whatever that fundamental entity is, that's the basis of the physical. It'll be some unthinking, soulless thing, they say. All right, but how can you be sure? No one can predict what physics is going to be like. No one predicted the discovery of quantum mechanics would be like that. This is radical and unexpected, um, at least for most people. I think you could say, oh, well, the similarities between 20th century physics and ancient philosophy like Plato's and the Vedanta philosophy indicates that it could have been predicted, but at any rate, this unspecified future physical theory is not a good way to define matter today. So some try to take the middle road, explaining the microphysical by referring to something like current microphysics, but just improved. All right, that doesn't solve the problem. Improved in what way? If you can't say, then you really don't know what the physical is. Uh, um, so then David Armstrong thinks, this is some, some thinker named David Armstrong said, he explicitly tells us that when he says physical properties, he is not talking about the properties specified by current physics, but rather, quote, whatever set of properties the physicists in the end will appeal to. Similarly, Frank Jackson holds that the physical facts encompass everything in a completed physics, chemistry, and neurophysiology, and all there is to know about the causal and relational facts consequent upon all this. Okay, so a complete physics. All right, but what will a complete physics be? Um, so on page 133, left-hand column, near the, the bottom, Chomsky has identified a related problem for those who define the physical in terms of a final physics. His point is that since we cannot predict the course of physics, we cannot be sure that a final physics will not include mental properties, qua mental, as fundamental properties. Yet a final physics takes the mental realm to be fundamental, the difference dissolves between physicalists who claim that mental properties will be accounted for in a final physics and dualists who claim that mental properties are fundamental. All right, so she's got another paragraph, but right there I want to stop. What is a final physics? It might include matter as a fundamental building block of existence. So to be a physicalist and say that the mind is a byproduct of the body and the body is defined as something made of matter as described by a final physics, a final chemistry and a final neurophysiology, that final theory of everything just might say that consciousness did not randomly emerge, but is the foundation from which existence itself emerges. All right, and what is a final physics? So I'm going back now to um, Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. So, so I wrote the book, Psyche and Singularity. That equation is based on Carl Jung's theory that if psyche or soul has energy, then according to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, that mass is just condensed energy. According to that theory, if psyche does have energy, then that energy must be equivalent to mass and it must be measurable, and yet we don't seem capable of measuring the mass of a soul. I think Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code author, he wrote another book, and if I recall it properly, it ended with them measuring a soul. Somebody died, they were in a highly sensitive measuring device, and when they left, the scale measured them weighing just a tiny, tiny bit less than that missing mass was their soul that had left. But um, 
so so at any rate how can you measure the energy of a soul and then Carl Jung said well maybe it's we can't measure it the problem isn't because it's so small maybe we can't measure it because it's infinite and then he mentioned Einstein's general theory of relativity or he, he speculated within that context and he said if it's traveling faster than light it would lose its extension in space it would also become infinitely heavy if it had any mass at all as I discussed previously um, and speed of light stops time and space uh, so in the end he concluded this letter he wrote on on February 29 1952 with the equation psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space so the highest intensity of energy is infinite the smallest space is zero volume and that's the definition of a gravitational singularity a point of infinite density uh, so I wrote psyche equals singularity and then I pointed to Carl Jung's relationship with Wolfgang Pauli, Nobel Prize winning co-discoverer of quantum mechanics back in 1927. And their theory, they had a theory of a future final physics, and it would be one that is intertwined with a future final psychology. Now, even to say a final physics, that goes against the scientific principle, at least as described by Karl Popper, or you can never prove a physical theory. You can only subject it to proofs that would falsify it. If it passes the test, it has not been falsified. That does not mean it has been proven to be true. It could always fail a future falsifier, falsifier test. Um, so I just want to mention that. But a final, a more complete physics and, and psychology, the physicalists say, will prove to us that the mind is just a byproduct of matter. But that is not what Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli said. Certainly not what Sir Roger Penrose, the newly anointed, appointed, or however you want to say, Nobel Prize winner, talks about consciousness. Um, so like Penrose, Jung and Pauli were Platonists for the most part. And this is what Wolfgang Pauli said. So I'm reading from, um, from my book, a quote from another book. And here's where he, where he talked about um, this mirror symmetry you should look for between psychology and physics in the future. He says the ordering and regulating factors must be placed beyond the distinction of physical and psychic as Plato's ideas share the notion of a concept and of a force of nature. They create actions out of themselves. I am very much in favor of referring to the ordering and regulating factors in terms of archetypes but then it would be impermissible to define them as contents of the psyche the mentioned inner images, dominant features of the collective unconscious after Jung, are rather psychic manifestations of the archetypes, which, however, would also have to put forth, create, condition, anything law-like in the behavior of the corporeal world, the world of the body. The laws of this world would then be the physical manifestation of the archetypes. Each law of nature should then have an inner correspondence and vice versa, even though this is not always directly visible today. So that is the future of physics, according to one of the most respected physicists of all. A fusion with psychology, not reducing mind or matter to one or the other, but reducing both of them to a more fundamental unus mundus, which I'm equating with the gravitational singularity. So here's another quote from Pauli. Um, and he's talking about this fusion of psychology of art. Jung's archetypal psychology, which is basically Plato's psychology with physics, which would include a synthesis of general relativity and quantum mechanics. He says, I don't know whether and when this conunctio will be realized, but I have no doubt that this would be the most beautiful destiny that could befall psychology and physics. So for the physicalists, who say, oh, phys matter is just whatever the physicists of the future tell us it is. Wolfgang Pauli's vision of the future of physics was that, that it would be synthesized with Platonic philosophy, which says that the soul is eternal. It's the foundation of being. Mind and matter radiate from the psyche. The psyche, I mean, that can get confusing. It, it brings in the issue of mind as a subtle form of matter, and the gross body is a grosser form of matter, and then there's something even more fundamental. Um, 
All right, but just continuing here on the left-hand column at the bottom, page 133, Barbara Montero, The Body Problem. A solution to the body problem is not forthcoming. Perhaps we should focus on questions other than the question, is the mind physical? So let me conclude with a suggestion. Physicalism is, at least partly, motivated by the belief that the mental is ultimately non-mental. That is, that mental properties are not fundamental properties, whereas dualism holds precisely that they are that mental properties are fundamental. They're not made of more fundamental things. It's the ground of existence. So a crucial question is whether the mental is ultimately non-mental. Of course, the notion of the non-mental is also open-ended, and for this reason, it may be just as difficult to see what sort of considerations are relevant in determining what counts as non-mental as it is to see what sort of considerations are relevant in determining what counts as physical. However, we do have a grasp of one side of the divide, that is, the mental. So rather than worrying about whether the mind is physical, we should be concerned with whether it is non-mental. And this question has little to do with what current physics, future physics, or a final physics says about the world. Is the mental non-mental? Is the mental ultimately physical? And her, she said, well, nobody can define what physical means. And I think I've gone over enough of the... Um, issues that are raised by that. Um, let me actually, you know, because I didn't get a chance to in this book so far, Plato's theory of the absolute ideas, what can we know, was one of the fundamental questions. So very briefly, according to Plato, if you look through various of the Platonic dialogues, which feature Socrates conversing with other people, his cosmology, which is fused with his idea of what a soul is, implies that the universe is a sphere with a point in the middle. That's where the soul is. If you read the Timaeus, this famous cosmological platonic dialogue, and that central soul also encompasses the outermost sphere. And the absolute ideas from which everything material radiates exist at each point of that outermost sphere. And when you die, your soul leaves your body and it goes out to that outermost sphere, if you've trained yourself in philosophy, where you can perceive the absolute ideas of everything that you perceive with your physical senses. You see the imperfect replicas of the perfect idea of those things out at the outermost sphere of the universe. All right, so that, and we saw Wolfgang Pauli talk about Plato's absolute ideas. This is what he's also looking for toward for a final physics and psychology. Mind and matter radiate from these absolute ideas. Where do they exist? According to Plato, out at the outermost sphere of the universe. Well, string theory, which unites quantum mechanics and general relativity. Leonard Susskind and Gerard Tehuft, another Nobel Prize winner in physics, they said, okay, this was the information paradox that Stephen Hawking um, brought up. He said, if information falls through the event horizon of a black hole, it's erased forever from the universe, it can never escape. That would undermine the law of the conservation of information, which is more fundamental than the law of conservation of energy and matter. So the solution to this problem was ultimately all the information that falls into a black hole is recorded on the event horizon and then leaks back out with the Hawking radiation. Since the universe is an inside-out black hole, which Stephen Hawking himself was the first to point out, reversing Roger Penrose's black hole equation, reversing the time dimension to make it explode from a singularity instead of contract into one. So since the universe is an inside-out black hole, all of the information that exists within the universe is also recorded at the outermost sphere. The past, the present, and the future of the entire universe is condensed at each point of this enormous two-dimensional sphere, which is defined as the point where space-time appears to be expanding away from us on Earth at the, at the speed of light. And then from that outermost sphere, which is like a holographic film containing the entire history of the universe, the fundamental threads of energy, which are very tiny, but they're also very elastic, they radiate in with the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang, to create the holographic illusion, the cinematic hologram of three-dimensional space. That is the most current physics, which so closely resembles Plato's cosmology and the Hindu cosmology, which we'll be discussing in the next section of our book. 
and Carl Jung's near-death experience, which I talked about previously. He said in 1944, he had a heart attack after he broke his foot. His consciousness rose a thousand miles above the earth, leaving his body behind. So consciousness does not require a brain. The brain enables consciousness to interact with other physically embodied beings, but self-awareness, memories, and everything else, so say these near-death experience accounts, exists even when the body's dead or when the heart has stopped beating. Out there from a thousand miles above the earth, he said, it seemed to him as if each of us in the three-dimensional space is imprisoned in a little box of space-time tethered to the horizon of the cosmos by a thread and that the past, the present, and the future are interwoven blissfully out at the horizon of the cosmos. So when Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung say, here's my prediction, in the future, physics and psychology will fuse. And when you see the future of physics and string theory perfectly parallel Jung's psychology, which is basically a restatement of Plato's cosmology, then we see, oh, this fusion of physics and psychology seems really to have come to pass. So um, that's why I looked forward to making this video about Barbara Montero and the body problem. And I hope in the future that this presumption of physicalism in academia will be cleansed from the mind and a more thorough understanding of what we mean by mind and matter will take its place. And I think it will have to involve somehow or another holographic string theory in Carl Jung's psychology, only because in my opinion, those are the pinnacles of those two respective academic fields psychology and physics. And if we're going to combine the two, as uh, Jung and Wolfgang Pauli said we should try to do, then it's, it's going to look something like Plato's cosmology, which is not that surprising considering academia began with Plato's academia. Um, you know, after what, what year was that? Socrates died in 399 BCE. So maybe you know I forget exactly he left for 10 years so sometime after that within about a decade after that academia officially began and now here we are 2400 years later it seems we've come full circle back to Plato and the irony is the charge was led by an atheist Leonard Susskind which makes this fusion of string theory and platonic union psychology I think more trustworthy because Susskind was not a willing partner in this synthesis. All right, so we, what, 43 minutes about. Um, in the next video, we'll start the section B of part four of our book, which discusses the self. What is the self? And we'll be discussing Buddhism and Hinduism.